Well, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle, and this is Afterburner. And once again, we need to do something so simple, so obvious and logical that no one in the present political landscape seems to have the basic education, the courage, or the simple common sense to try to attempt. We need to look back, not way back, but well within living memory, to see what happens when the idea of tolerance merely becomes a code word for suicide. You know, we today cannot fully appreciate the transformational psychological horror that the First World War produced upon the world, but most especially upon the British Empire. In the Battle of the Somme alone, British casualties were, in one day, 19,240 dead, 35,000 493 wounded, 2,152 missing, and 585 prisoners for a loss of 57,470 soldiers in one day. And of course, the Somme was just another abattoir in a war that produced scores of these horrors over four heartbreaking years and which ended in nothing but bitterness, death, horror, and resentment. I think it's fair to say that it shattered the psyche of the British people in a way that they have never fully recovered from. But the lesson we need to draw from this as modern Americans is not about the horror of the battlefield. The real lesson for our times is the reaction of the British political class in the years following the Great War. You see, the revulsion and the shock and the horror of that war produced in the British elites an absolute psychological unwillingness to face such things ever again. They were so mortified by what they'd experienced that they simply refused to see the evidence of two decades building step by methodical step and each new data point pointing ever more certainly towards a conflict that they, with a single magnificent exception, simply refused to face because they contracted a terminal case of moral cowardice. As Hitler grew in power, those British and French and American elites refused to see what was plainly before their eyes, namely that Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party were made of less sensitive, less noble, and less gentle stuff. Hitler's own German generals feared war even more than the French and British generals did, but Adolf Hitler had accurately read the Allied political leadership and by a series of ever-increasing provocations, he continued to test his theory against their reactions. Starting with minor transgressions to outright violations of the Treaty of Versailles, to annexation of territories and then entire countries, then to open shooting war, the British elites refused, refused to see him and his ideology for what they were despite all the evidence. They preached tolerance and understanding. They bent over backward to make the case that they themselves, the victorious allies, were the cause of all of this rising evil. And the result of this weakness, this irresolution, this moral and physical cowardice was the creation of the certainty in the mind of Hitler and the Nazis that the West had become so weak, so morally decadent, and afraid that they would never fight again. That miscalculation led to the greatest disaster in human history. The Japanese made an identical calculation with regard to the Americans and were amazed that we simply did not surrender the Pacific after their attack on Pearl Harbor. No, it is weakness, not strength, cowardice, not courage and resolute action that start wars. And it was the preaching of tolerance and acceptance of these challenges and intentional provocations by the liberals and progressives of the times that were directly responsible for those wars. And so today, starting 31 years ago, a totalitarian Iranian theocracy committed an act of blatant warfare against the most powerful military force in the world. They had bet on the weakness of the American president, Jimmy Carter, and the post-Vietnam weariness and disgust of the American people. The storming of the American embassy in Tehran brought them not overwhelming military response, but like the British and French reactions to Hitler 40 years earlier, simply strongly worded diplomatic letters and behind the scenes sympathy for the so-called injustices they'd endured. The hostages, which had been held for 444 days as a banner of American weakness, were returned within hours of the election of a new president 
perceived to be cut from somewhat stronger cloth. Now, since then, that radical Islamic philosophy, Shia terrorism exported throughout the world by Iran, and Sunni terrorism called Wahhabism, advanced by our good friends the Saudis, has been at war nonstop, not just with America in Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan, but in perpetual attacks against Jews in Israel, at war with Russia in Chechnya, at war with Hindus in India in the Kashmir, at war with African animists and Christians in Darfur and throughout the rest of Africa, at war with Buddhists in Asia, at war with the Chinese, with the Uyghurs, fomenting rebellions in South America, and so on. For the last 30 years, Jihadi elements have pushed and pushed and pushed against the strength of their enemies and found, in Europe certainly, no strength at all. None. No demand is too outrageous for the progressives to cloak their fear and their refusal to confront a violent enemy as tolerance and respect for the very principles and actions that are antithetical to what they once held as irreducible core beliefs, back when they actually believed in something. Now, in America, Osama bin Laden made the same calculation of weakness and moral cowardice that Hitler and Tojo and Khomeini had made before him. But, unfortunately for him, the Jimmy Carters and Bill Clintons needed for such a gambit to pay off were not in office on that day. The unexpected and strong American response cost the Islamic Caliphate their stronghold in Afghanistan and the ancient heart of the Caliphate itself, Baghdad, Al-Qaeda put all their chips into Iraq, and thanks to a few hundred thousand votes in the state of Ohio at the end of 2004, they ended up utterly defeated. So after 9-11, no further attacks on American soil were forthcoming, because there seemed to be, to their utter amazement, given what they see in our movies and our news media, unseen strength left in America. But now. Weakness is the coin of the realm once again, and the provocations and challenges come faster and they're more daring. Bombers on airplanes, bombs in Times Square, massacres at army bases by Muslims in American uniforms, and in the aftermath of all of these, we are lectured that we need to be more tolerant, more understanding, we need to make more concessions and make more apologies. You know, the rhetoric of the U.S. State Department in 2010 and the British Foreign Ministry in 1938 are virtually indistinguishable. And if we do not change things, and very quickly, the results will be indistinguishable too. The very terms Islam, Jihad, Al-Qaeda, Hudna, Sharia, Caliphate, and all the others have been banned, banned from being used by our own Defense Department. We cannot make plans to counter this enemy threat because we are not, by presidential order, allowed to even name them. And we will pay the price for this cowardice. And we may pay it on a scale that makes our losses in World War II seem almost quaint, practically nostalgic. Which brings me to the Cordoba Mosque being built near the wreckage of Ground Zero. Now, to those who have the ability to read, there's no question what this mosque is. It's not a modest house of worship for American Muslims seeking to peacefully practice their religion. One of those actually already exists. The Majid Manhattan has existed peacefully for years. It condemns all acts of terrorism and denies any involvement whatsoever with the provocation of the Cordoba Mosque. You know, throughout the violent history of Islam, conquered provinces immediately have their most cherished symbols, churches, synagogues, temples, and so on, immediately converted into mosques. Now, this is to establish Islam's high water marks, to plant flags at the point of deepest penetration. They're very much like the little red flags that the British soldiers carried on the first day of the Psalm to mark the limits of their advance against the enemy. Now, we are lectured daily that we must not only put up with all of this, but actually celebrate it that compromise and tolerance and surrender are somehow now the defining American values. This mosque is being funded by foreign money. Its so-called moderate leaders have proven radical ties, and it will eventually be the pulpit for the Islamic takeover of America in the same way that trophy mosques in London and Paris and Oslo and Copenhagen and Berlin and all the others are. So the question is simply this. 
Is this a genuine house of peaceful religious worship, a place of mutual respect and tolerance to grow greater understanding, as we've been told, or is it something else? Well, ask yourself this. If this is as well-intentioned as we are told, who's doing all of the understanding and tolerating here? Are Christian churches and Jewish synagogues allowed in Mecca? They are not. Do Christian and Jewish and Buddhist and Hindu congregations meet every week to hear sermons about the destruction of the Muslim religion, the way that hundreds of millions of Muslims chant death to America and death to Israel and death to the West in their religious services every week? They do not. Do Christian or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist believers call for separate treatment and their own legal systems for themselves in those few Muslim countries where they're allowed to exist at all? They do not. Tolerance, as it's being sold to us, is exclusively a one-way street, but a tolerant society is one that works both ways. Truly tolerant, moderate American Muslims would understand the pain and the provocation that this mosque generates among their fellow citizens, and if they genuinely believe in the mutual respect and understanding that they claim to want to create, why would they begin with such a poke in the eye to the people that they claim to want to improve relations with? American Japanese citizens did not insist on a Shinto shrine on the banks of Ford Island overlooking the wreck of the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor, because that is what mutual tolerance looks like. Giving up everything, at every turn, to people who give up nothing in return and whose response to charity and decency is merely to increase the outrageousness of their demands is not tolerance, and it's not decency, and it's certainly not moral superiority. It's not the highest ideals of the American character. It's cowardice. It's the unwillingness to face a threat proclaimed by loudspeakers all across the world every single week. It's the moral weakness to face the fact that for every ideology in the world, there is an opposing one that wishes for, plans for, prays for, and eventually executes its destruction. And it's one more data point that our pampered, idiotic, and self-proclaimed morally superior elites have reached a point of self-loathing and self-delusion that drives them to actions that are indistinguishable from suicide. Cowards, you see, have a moral, psychological, and intellectual imperative to claim that their cowardice is in fact strength and their moral weakness is somehow, simply because they say so, moral superiority. But those of us who still know the difference between mutual tolerance and compromise versus unilateral concession, surrender, and suicide, well, we have very little time left. About two and a half months as I record this. Oh, and by the way, the same people tell us that we also need to be tolerant of the crime wave and massive illegal invasion of our southern border and for the same reasons. Remember that in November because, my friends, we are running out of time.